This session is entitled Transforming and Democratizing the State from Top to Bottom. And I'm excited by the group of people who we brought together for the panel. I'm gonna introduce each speaker in more detail before they speak, but for now, I want to mention quickly who they are and welcome them to the discussion. Our panelists are Caterina Principe from Portugal, Gabriel Hetland, who will be talking about Venezuela, Eric Palomares from Mexico, and Kali Acuno from the United States. Before providing a fuller introduction of each speaker, I'd like to go over the format briefly. Each panelist will get around 20 minutes to speak, after which we will have about 30 minutes or so for an open exchange. If you have questions you'd like to share throughout the session, you can do so through the Q&A button in the Zoom panel at the bottom of the screen. Feel free to message in the chat, but if you have a question for the panelists, please make sure to put it in the Q&A box in the Zoom control panel so I can see it. I will also invite questions and contributions from other conference panelists who've spoken before or who will be speaking during other parts of the conference. So I will ask you all to be prepared when the panelists have finished speaking. With that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Caterina Principe. Caterina is a social and political activist from Portugal and a contributing editor at Jacobin. She is a co-editor with Bhaskar Shunkara of Europe in Revolt, mapping the new European left. Welcome, Katerina. So uh, first of all, um, just the, the, the idea of my contribution today is to talk about um, European integration, state transformation, and strategy for the left. That is the, those are very two, three very big things. So I'll try to condensate them a little bit um, and I hope it, it works out. And I, yeah, I want to start by saying thank you to the organizers of the conference. It's, uh, it's, it's really a big endeavor to do something like this, especially in times like this. Um, and um, uh, I, basically what I wanna say today, I, I, I wanna try out an argument um, and see if it works. And if you think that it is some sort of a good idea. Um, and the argument goes that the, um, the difficulties for specifically uh, Southern European left parties to establish a strong and coherent strategy today comes from the difficulties that of, of what I call the political economy of European integration and very importantly from the types of states that this sort of integration has prompted. Um, and so in that sense, what I will try to do is to first go over quickly, uh, very briefly um, about what I, what I call the political economy of European integration. Then the second part will be uh, about the importance of states in this dynamic. Um, then a very short resume of what the experience of the left uh, in Europe and what we've been calling the parties of, new, of a new type has been over the last 20 years. And, um, and then in the end, I wanna give out some, I wanna share with you some thoughts on the difficulty of building um, a strategy for the left. And so um, to start with this uh, idea of the political economy of European integration, um, and this is not a new discussion, it's actually, um, a discussion that is very present in the field, for example, of political economy uh, through all this uh, literature body of the varieties of capitalism, for example. Um, and I think the varieties of capitalism do um, imply in their thought process, in their arguments, uh, this idea of um, that different varieties of capitalism imply different varieties of states um, uh, but in my opinion, it comes a bit short from the debate, uh, a bit more, a bit, a bit of a broader debate beyond the idea of the welfare state. So it discusses the types of political economy that are, uh, present in different European countries, but it doesn't really discuss the type, uh, of states that come out from this positioning. 
And so the definition of the, this, the economic profiles of each country within the European Union, I argue, has to be aligned with one, the belonging, yes, of course, to this transnational capitalist project uh, of uh, imperialist vibe, which is the European Union, but also, secondly, uh, it has to be linked to a specific role uh, within that space that each of these countries uh, occupies. Um, and, and I think it's important here to reinforce this um, dynamic of dependency uh, through integration. Uh, there are some, um, some uh, authors in political economy, uh, uh, like for example, Stockhammer has a, an interesting um, approach to this where he's talking about the concept of growth regimes. And when he talks about countries of Southern Europe, he defines them as debt-led growth regimes or debt-led economies. Um, and, and, and I think there's a very interesting political stake when you say that an economy is a debt-led economy, because as we know, if an economy is based in, on debt uh, towards other countries and in, in a big case towards the countries in the core of the European Union, um, then it means that this country is not only economically, but in my opinion, this is where I will go next, it becomes very politically dependent on the dynamics of the core of this transnational process that is, as I say, composed by different states in a dependent relation with one another. And so if we agree, and as we know, and this is of course not an experience only from Southern European countries, there are many activists, uh, activists and academics here today from Latin America that can talk about how important the concept of debt is in, uh, in um, imposing disciplinary measures upon countries and peoples. Um, and also, this is what I will argue, and, and I think the, the European Union and, and what it means for Southern Europe has a sort of particularity about disciplinary, disciplinary measures and dynamics because it, this, this disciplinary measures do question, as we know, the level of sovereignty of these states, but it does so in the European Union at, at a particular uh, level or in a particular way. So um, this process of European integration has meant, and this is in a very short, said, said in a very short way, um, throughout the last 40 years for, for Southern European countries, basically the destruction of its productive sectors, uh, of its industries and the substitution, so in its economic profile uh, of, of, of a more productive industrial profile into a non-tradable service oriented uh, profile. And of course, this has meant two things. It means that if a country is not producing what it, what it's, what it needs, uh, it has to import from the core, mainly, uh, the products that are produced at the center. And at the same time, it also means that uh, it creates a loss in the capacity of um, generating actual economic growth. And this is substituted then by a given very easy access to credit that is given simultaneously to private companies, households, but also to the state. And this is where I want to come now. So um, what I think, think is a little bit missing in, in a little bit in this literature of the varieties of capitalism and so on, as I said, is that um, economic profiles or growth regimes don't exist beyond the state. And uh, my argument is that they are actually about their transformation because I tend to look at this dynamics having the state as its central actor. So um, the state is still, and this is something that I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, I'm not quoting Leo Panic since I think we're also honoring him here in this conference uh, now, uh, is that the states today are still very much uh, the enablers uh, of the rules that organize production, circulation, distribution, the, and the organization in general of capital within its boundaries, and therefore are also decisive in the type of international relations that they establish 
um, and what spheres and what groups they valorize. Um, so uh, what is interesting to see if you look at Southern Europe is that um, the process of European integration did actually on the one hand profoundly transform the states, um, but it also transformed the states in a particular way. And my argument is that um, uh, both uh, all Portugal, Greece, Italy and Spain upon their process of European integration were actually coming from long lasting authoritarian post-fascist regimes um, that um, didn't have fully liberalized markets. And so the, 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 the process of European integration has also meant uh, the valorization of a fraction of the, the, these national bourgeoisies uh, towards another. So uh, the big, for uh, Portugal is a good case of this um, transformation that, uh, but Greece is as well. I mean, Polanzas has written a couple of things about it. So, and Portugal is also a, an interesting case to see how, uh, the big industrial groups um, throughout 40 years of an authoritarian regime actually basically disappeared uh, upon the, the beginning of the process of European integration, giving space for a new bourgeoisie that was more centered on services, on the banking sector, um, on tur tourism and um, real estate. Um, and so the process of European integration changes the capacities of the state, but it also alters profoundly the structure of the social classes within the country. And this happens for the bourgeoisie, but it also happens for um, the structure of the popular classes as well, uh, not only because of the, the, the building of a so-called middle class, which we can question today specifically after or with the outcomes of the global financial crisis of 2007, 2008, whether it still actually exists, but it did, this process of European integration did establish um, a preeminent middle class in this country that didn't exist as such or as structured before uh, and really not in, if we are comparing it to, for example, Germany or France. Um, and, uh, and so the, the, um, another thing that I want to say that I think it's also important is that the EU is also, the European Union is also a political project. And it's not only a political project from the sense of a disciplinary top down imposing certain rules and norms, but because the European Union privileges and supposedly only accepts countries with political regimes that are liberal and democratic. Um, it does impose a certain form of organizing the state apparatus and its political regimes. So if you want to enter this project, your state, the way you organize it, both at the political as at the economical level, has to abide to this, this rules. Um, so what has resulted for um, for the states that I think is very clear in the periphery of, of, of Europe is that the states um, coming out or that are still in an ongoing process of European integration uh, have um, specific capacities. Um, so they, they, they gained some capacity, so they're more democratic, they, uh, this is, um, it's not the at the, this, I'm not talking about the same time frame, but recovering a little bit this idea of Millward that James Midway already uh, quoted yesterday about the European rescue of the nation state. So that that's also true for these countries, but it's it implies specific the specific loss of capacities. For example, the full force uh, privatization of the strategic sectors of the economy, um, the destruction by defunding normally uh, strong social states. Um, it also meant the, re, the, the redesign of um, more protective and more social labor laws. Um, and it meant, as I said before, exactly because of this idea of the debt-led growth regime, it has implied a state that um, has been taking up debt in order to be able to finance its own, uh, its own economy. 
and it did so. Uh, uh, and in Southern Europe, it's very clear. Portugal is a good example of this by guaranteeing the rule of this fraction of the bourgeoisie, as I argue, through uh, creating forms of monopoly, through uh, very strong and very preeminent, very, very, um, very uh, uh, present public-private uh, partnerships. And what that means ex uh, specifically is that um, the Southern European elites do actually never have to um, uh, take many risks because they know that there's always a state that they're very uh, dependent on. So a very, it's a very rentist bourgeoisie that depends very much on the state that is willing at all the times. And the, 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 the 2007, 2008 crisis was very clear on this to transform private debt into sovereign debt. And so these states, I would characterize them as a little bit of bailout states. So they're the ones who are always willing to uh, intervene when the markets uh, and uh, the, the, are not working very well for private companies. So this is one part. The second part that I want to go to basically is the, um, the question for how does this imply a difficulty for a left-wing or a coherent left-wing strategy? And uh, just to make it very short, um, throughout after 89, as we know in Europe, there were no, no big uh, left-wing parties that were uh, capable of disputing state power. The, the, the center of politics shifted very much to the right. And so uh, more or less 20 years, 25 years ago, um, coming out of the experience of the ultra globalization movement, there was a recomposition of the left in many countries in Europe and in all the countries of Southern Europe actually. Uh, at different times, at different pace, different speeds. I don't want to go there right now. And so th there was the recomposition through the formations of what we call broad left parties or parties of a new type. So they're not ideologically uh, so uh, coherent. Uh, they are they are refusing refusing at the same time uh, the social liberal parties, the former traditional social democratic parties that have become liberal. At the same time, creating a space. Uh, that is uh, uh, something different from the traditional CPs, the traditional communist parties that, are, that were very uh, much uh, linked or very much st Stalinized also in the way that they function and organize. Um, and this experience of recomposition created experience that we all probably have heard about, the left bloc in Portugal, Podemos in Spain. They're all the, so the same type of thinking. Syriza in Greece, or what it was, not what it is today. Um, Refondazione in Italy. Die Linke in, 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 in Germany, even if I don't want to go there because it's, a, again, a different experience. Um, but they're all parties that have the same, this, this type of characteristic. And the experience of these parties, because they were capable of recomposing, and finally, also just parenthesis, uh, it's very important to understand that these experiences happen in parliamentary regimes where if you have elections, um, you can actually enter parliament in some percentage of your voting. So even if there are thresholds, that there are in Greece, there are thresholds. In Portugal, there aren't thresholds, but in Greece or in Germany, for example, there are thresholds. It means that th there is some sort of representation in the national parliament that you can get if you get X percent in, in, in the election. So this is a very important thing because in, in political systems that are not parliamentary in this sense, it's much harder for this type of parties to exist in this way. Um, but the problems with these parties, because they, um, none of these parties had in general a very clear um, basis of support that was linked to, to the trade unions, um, for example, which, which was the case of most left-wing experiences that we have experienced, that we have, that we know of, of from, the, from the 20th century, uh, these parties sort of built their own, their only strategic uh, direction towards electoral politics, so towards the state, in a sense, um, and building in many ways from the social movements of the time. But um, uh, 
You have two minutes. But the, I have two minutes, yeah? Yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> so, but because on the one hand, there is all over the world, the reorganization of labor and the difficulty through, uh, through precarity to organize labor, but at the same time, because the direction was electoral politics and therefore the, the dispute of the state, um, and because in my opinion, this is my argument, this type of states, the states that are coming out from the process of European integration are states with very few sovereign capacities since these states don't have their own currency, they don't control their own budgets, their own con they don't control their own fiscal policies, um, they, 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 are, they, they don't control even their public debt or, or their deficit levels. It means it becomes very hard for parties that frame their main political strategy upon the state to actually be capable of winning um, state power. And when that happened in Greece with Syriza, we could see this shortcoming very clear. It, because I think the problem was, was twofold in Greece. It was not only about a misconception of the EU, which was also true, because that's then the other problem that all this process of dependency poses for the left particularly in Southern Europe. So if you don't know how to deal concretely with the EU, and it is a very hard question to deal with, all your strategy becomes difficult to, difficult to make concrete, um, but also because it was too much focused on a state that is a social relation uh, embedded in this process of integration. Um, and so just to end because, and then we can go back for some questions and so on. I just wanted to say that um, I think it is very important uh, and James Midway also pointed to some of these ideas yesterday and I thought it was, it was a good, um, I mean, I had it written down already but it's good because there are some of these ideas that are important. So it was not only, I don't think it's only because people don't feel that this left populist ideas, um, which are important and you have to have them uh, in a way. It's not just because people don't feel that they are not possible to make concrete today. They've seemed so impossible and so far-fetched, um, but also because the type of the state that you have will not allow you to actually make concrete these proposals if at least if you don't have other forms of organized that run against the state in many ways and are building forms of organization that have to do with other forms of ownership, all the, and even the experience of all the solidarity movements that are growing from the root, and of course the reorganization of the labor movement, which I think have to be the priorities for these parties, because if not, you will encounter really an iron cage that is not only the EU, but the type of state that came out from this process of integration. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Katarina. Um, Next up, we have Gabriel Hetland. Uh, Gabriel is an assistant professor of Latin American, Caribbean, and Latino studies and sociology. His research focuses on participatory institutions, electoral politics, social movements, and direct action, and labor and community organizing, a lot of AMs, in Latin America and the United States. Gabriel's work has been published in scholarly journals such as Qualitative Sociology and Latin American Perspectives, in numerous popular press outlets, including The Nation, Jacobin, In These Times, NACLA, Al Jazeera, The Real News, The Guardian, NPR, and Telesur. Gabriel, welcome. All right, thanks so much, uh, Daniel, for the introduction. Thank you very much to the organizers uh, for putting this together. And I also wanted to acknowledge the you know, very sad losses of uh, both Eric Olinwright and Leo Panich, both of whose ideas have inspired me in so many ways and also uh, will be somewhat evident, I think, in the remarks I'll give today. So let me get right to it. The question I'll address is whether or not Venezuela can teach us about democratic socialism. Um, and there's many different views on this. There's some on the left, such as Nathan Robinson, who uh, argues that Venezuela can teach us absolutely nothing about uh, socialism uh, because Venezuela wasn't socialist and therefore you know, we can't learn it. Uh, Marco Rubio, of course, says Venezuela can teach us everything we need to know about socialism, which is that it always fails. Um, so I'll partially agree with Marco Rubio that Venezuela can teach us uh, about democratic socialism, but I'm not going to argue that it always fails, but that there's a lot of challenges. And if we look at the Venezuelan case, we can understand the immensity of those challenges and how to partially overcome them, as well as clearly how to not overcome them. 
Um, so the, the basic argument I'll have uh, is that Venezuela under Chavez is the most successful case of left governance in decades. Um, but it's also the most spectacular case of left failure in many decades. And so to really comprehend and understand it, we have to grasp both of those dimensions and we have to try to explain uh, both the success and the profound failure, which I'll try to briefly do. Uh, so in my remarks, I'll start by um, talking about a sort of theoretical framework drawing on Polancis, Gramsci, and Margaret Thatcher, another great theorist of uh, hegemony uh, for the right. And uh, then I'll briefly talk about the rise and fall of Chavismo and how I sort of characterize it. Um, I'll then focus on a local level case uh, of uh, municipal uh, democratic socialism within uh, Venezuela under Chavez. And then I'll give some brief uh, concluding remarks putting the Venezuelan case in comparative perspective. Um, so the, the center of my argument is that Venezuela did not achieve democratic socialism, but it came much closer which is to say not that close, but significantly closer than many other cases uh, in many, many years. Um, and it was most sort of impressive in achieving what I refer to as a form of left populist hegemony. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by that um, in a second. So I think Palantas is useful for thinking about the broad challenges of constructing democratic socialism. And he in an essay that's widely read, I'm sure many people listening have read it, uh, towards a democratic socialism, he identifies three main challenges. Um, two are what sort of attempts to construct socialism can turn into, and then one is the sort of reactive sequence that it sets in motion. So social democracy uh, is one challenge that has very, very frequently beset movements for socialism. Um, authoritarian statism is a second challenge, and Palantas argues in a way that I think is accurate that both of those forms, both social democracy and authoritarian statism as an expression of state socialism, are forms of statism that distrust mass demands and become a sort of elitist political projects which have very different expressions. Um, and then a third challenge is the reaction of the enemy or the bourgeoisie and domestic and international um, manifestations. And so we can see all of these challenges happening within Venezuela, um, but we can also see the sort of way to get past them, which is a, a combined struggle within and against the state. So this is sort of building on Leo Panitch's theorizing. Um, and Venezuela shows that, and the, the key to sort of constructing this struggle is to have a left political project which continuously arouses or mobilizes a broad popular movement um, which also remains autonomous from the left project. So it's a very difficult, fragile, challenging balance, uh, which at times existed within Venezuela and then at other times has certainly not existed. Um, so to get to democratic socialism, you have to avoid the sort of status path of social democracy, the status path of authoritarian state socialism, and figure out a way to defeat right-wing and imperialist reactions. So all to say it's a very difficult challenge. Um, all right, so onto the, the Venezuelan case. Uh, Chavez was elected, of course, in 1998, uh, ushering in the you know decade and a half or so of the left turn. Um, he confronted quite a bit of elite hostility, which is common to leftist projects when they get into power through elections or through arms. Um, and that uh, reaction that Chavez confronted pushed him into a stance of left populist mobilization. Uh, which was characterized by participatory dem democracy being a sort of central rhetorical element, um, constant and escalating organization and mobilization of popular sectors and increasing spending on the poor. Um, so this happened uh, roughly around 2002. There was a 2002 coup. There was a 2002-2003 uh, oil strike or management lockout within Venezuela. There was a recall referendum against Chavez in 2004. All of that put the political and to some extent physical survival of Chavez and his regime in question. And he responded uh, by trying to sort of construct this popular bulwark. So left populist mobilization was a response to the uh, right wing and imperialist reaction that Chavez uh, confronted. Um, it also coincided with the commodities boom starting in 2003 and lasting to some extent through about 2013, 2014. Um, so there's a degree of luck within the Venezuelan case. Um, so this sort of left populist mobilization combined with 
hugely increased prices of oil, as well as Chavez's charisma, um, and uh, the U.S. having a sort of diminished uh, regional influence within Latin America, in part a sort of shadow of the U.S. involvement in the war in Iraq. Um, all of this allowed for the consolidation of this left populist hegemony from roughly 2004 to 2013 or so. Um, so one part of this was a sort of consolidation of a popular base, and this happened um, in an important material way, which I want to talk about for uh, a couple of uh, minutes, where uh, the economy of Venezuela experienced tremendous economic growth between 2005 and 2000. Uh, 13, there was about 4.5% average growth during these years. From 2004 to 2008, Venezuela looked like China. It had almost 11% annual growth uh, for a number of years. So oil was a, a crucial part of this. Um, and the sort of social or socioeconomic base was the redistribution of this oil-fueled growth. Uh, state spending on uh, the poor and social services, education, healthcare, doubled as a percent of GDP between 1998 and 2011. It went from about 11% of the uh, GDP to close to 23% of the GDP uh, by 2011, right before Chavez left office. There was subsidies, price controls, direct state provisioning, uh, which allowed the Chavez administration to partially decommodify um, goods and services, including housing, electricity, education, um, so a whole host of things. And from 2006 onwards, the government took on a rhetoric and to some extent in a very contradictory way, a sort of policies of socialism of the 21st century. So it sort of uh, pushed in a more radical uh, direction. One of the most interesting aspects of this period, and here's where I wanna bring in Margaret Thatcher, um, is the way it changed the opposition. So that third problem that Pulantas and everyone you know, else points to, the reaction of the enemy shifted around 2005 through Chavez's death in 2013 because Venezuela became the leading political force within the country to such an extent that the opposition had to play the political game on Chavismo's political terrain. So I think this is somewhat of an underappreciated element of the Venezuelan story. So I'll discuss it for a couple of minutes. Thatcher comes in because she was asked in, I think 2000, what her greatest accomplishment was. And she quipped that it was Tony Blair. Um, and then she explained it saying, we forced our opponents to change their minds. Chavez did the same thing with the opposition. So they of course tried to unseat him repeatedly um, in his first five to six years in office. But by the 2006 election, the opposition was running on a sort of Chavista light platform. They were promising their own version of redistribution. Um, this really is clear in the 2012 election when Enrique Capriles, who was the right wing opposition candidate, proclaimed himself to be the Lula of Venezuela and said that he would run the missions that Chavez had established better than Chavez himself could do. Um, gave a series of concrete proposals to do this. And my own research shows that this wasn't just rhetoric. Capriles' party, Primera Justicia, which is the leading sort of center-right party in Venezuela, did a very robust participatory budget. I was highly suspicious when I started my research in 2009, 2010, uh, but found that they were devoting you know, tens of millions of dollars to a participatory budget, working with Chavista organizations, really, really doing some you know, solid actual grassroots organizing. There was many limitations, contradictions, but it shows the transformation of politics within Venezuela during this period. Um, so the pillars on which this rested were high oil prices, Chavez's charisma, US uh, influence uh, declining within Latin America. All of that went away in about 2013. Um, Chavez died, the price of oil plummeted, US influence increased first under Obama and then dramatically more under Trump. Um, so this had an important effect and it basically uh, led to the disintegration of this form of left populist hegemony. Um, so the social gains achieved under Chavismo were gone by 2015, 2016. Um, and then there was a massive sort of uh, retreat on the economic front to the most profound you know, economic crisis, potentially in modern Latin American history, maybe in global history for a non war country are one of the most profound crises, rising hunger, rising poverty, rising inequality. So massive, massive achievements that have been achieved under Chavez were uh, degraded and deteriorated. This led to an opposition victory in the 2015 uh, parliamentary elections. I was down there as an observer and 
you know, they were really serious about making sure that the world could see how clean these elections were. The opposition said they'd be fraudulent until they won. Um, this led to a new dynamic within Venezuela where uh, the opposition pushed a very hard regime change strategy. There was a wave of uh, sort of often violent protest in 2014, another wave in 2017, um, again, heightened U.S. imperialist uh, pressure on Venezuela. Um, and the response of the Maduro administration was uh, sort of bumbling economic responses, no clarity in terms of what to do, despite, you know, fairly coherent advice from leftist economists within the country about how to fix the currency policy, um, is the most pressing problem. I don't have time to get into that particular issue, but it's a crucial one. Um, and unfortunately, the government turned in a more and more authoritarian direction. There's huge debates about this. Is the authoritarian justified within Venezuela? Should we make sense of it as a defensive action that makes sense? I think even if you grant that, which I don't particularly, but even if you granted that, the effects of it have been to close the political space, not just for the right, not just for centrist parties, but also for the left. Uh, the UN has documented in pretty horrifying detail the deteriorating political and human rights situation. They've accused Maduro with some credibility of crimes against humanity. There have been, uh, you know, five to six thousand uh, extra institutional killings by police forces. There's been repression of leftist political forces who've been locked up, prevented from uh, running in elections. There's also been repression of right-wing political forces. So um, all of the sort of classical problems we've seen in the Soviet Union and other cases of state socialism, even though Venezuela wasn't that, um, it followed much of the authoritarian playbook. Maduro has even sort of, you know, compared himself favorably to Stalin uh, with the mustache and everything. Um, so that's a sort of um, brutal endpoint, but um, we shouldn't lose sight of the other factors. So it's not just a sort of voluntarist reading of the Maduro administration. There's the opposition actions, which are sort of pushing uh, constantly for regime change. There's the U.S. sabotaging dialogue attempts, implementing a utterly debilitating oil embargo, brutal economic sanctions, practically genocidal if you look at their sort of you know, foreknowledge of the massive impact this will have on the population. Um, so I'll come back to the sort of, you know, explanation for this different period in a minute, but um, I want to now go back to the high point of Chavismo and think a little bit more about the contradictions of it um, and the way in which it allowed for uh, possibilities for achieving local expressions of democratic socialism. And there's one particular case that I'll look at, which is uh, the municipality of Torres, which is in the central western state of Laura in Venezuela. In 2004, a radical left uh, social movement leader named Julio Chavez, unrelated to Hugo Chavez, um, was elected mayor by a thin, thin margin on the backs of rural and urban popular movements um, against the ruling party. So against the MVR, the Fifth Republic Movement of Chavez at the time, which was running a local contractor um, and had previously backed a sort of right wing agrarian elite who'd been the mayor uh, with the MVR through 2003. And then he flipped to the opposition and he ran again in 2004. So uh, a radical left party ran, ran in 2000. Uh, four on a sort of participatory democracy platform, a sort of democratic socialist platform, um, defeating the ruling party. But the relationship between uh, Julio Chavez and the Chavista movement for the next several years was very interesting. Um, and it showed precisely what this struggle within and against the state can actually look like in concrete detail. Uh, so Julio Chavez identified with the Bolivarian Revolution. He identified with Hugo Chavez. He had tried to run on the ruling party's uh, uh, line in the elections and were refused repeatedly. Uh, but he organized the base of that party into communal councils, into communes eventually. Um, and just to give you a sort of sense of his rhetoric, he talked constantly about socialism. So he says, we say all expressions of socialism should be based on the people's participation, a participation that impedes bureaucratism. It should start with the idea of constructing popular power uh, make visible projects of governing with the people, not for the people. So decisions are taken by the people. We'd rather err with the people than be right without the people. So uh, I'll wrap it up sort of quickly on this and then get to the conclusions because I know I'm a little short on time. But uh, he put this into practice through a municipal constituent assembly where ordinary citizens rather than party bureaucrats rewrote the rules of the municipality. Um, they had popular assemblies throughout the municipality. There was then a extensive participatory budget, which uh, to my knowledge has continued through this day, although I think it's deteriorated a lot since 2016. 
um, where ordinary citizens were the ones making the decisions. The mayor would say famously and accurately that he couldn't even veto decisions he didn't like. Uh, there was actually evangelical churches took up 10% of the budget the first year. He was furious about this, but given the rules, he couldn't do anything about it. So it really was a sort of expression of popular power for good or ill. Um, it was also a very deliberative process. I went to dozens of meetings and you could really see fine grain analysis or ordinary people debating sewers and uh, farmland and you know all the nitty gritty sort of projects. Um, and it was a politically pluralistic project. So it did do what Palanza says, where you retain many of the forms of representative democracy, but you radicalize them, you push them in a participatory direction. Uh, so there are some people from the opposition, there was different factions within the Chavista movement. They didn't always get along, but they all participated. They fought it out in a genuinely democratic way. Um, this came through popular mobilization inside and outside the state. And it, some very concrete examples of this, the Municipal Constituent Assembly, um, Chavez tried to get it approved by the uh, city council, which was controlled by uh, the Fifth Republic movement, Chavez, who, Hugo Chavez's uh, political party. In 2005, they refused, so he mobilized thousands of supporters to occupy city hall. He did the same thing when the participatory budget was shut down. They would refuse to recognize the results of this. This was successful in getting each of these measures to have more teeth and getting them through. Um, so this process continued for several years where he was sort of pushing a participatory project within the state while also mobilizing outside the state. Um, the project also moved beyond just the political sphere to uh, socialist production factories, which predictably led to other struggles with the Ministry of Electricity, with um, other ministries. There's uh, Torres, this municipality is seen as a leader in the formation of communes, um, but most of those had to struggle against national institutions. So the way in which achievements happened, not just in Torres, but throughout sort of Chavista, Venezuela, was this constant push to transform the institutions of the state, but also to build a popular movement from outside. All right, so now let me. Uh, We'll you know, step back from these details and give you the you know quick conclusions in 90 seconds. Um, so the you know the first conclusion I think we can think about in relationship to cases like Syriza, uh, Dilma Rousseff in Brazil, uh, Evo Morales even in Bolivia. So all of these were you know varying degrees, radical or not, leftist uh, forms of government uh, which came into office. None of them managed to achieve a form of leftist hegemony as happened in Venezuela. For Bolivia, that's a little more controversial. So I can discuss that in q and I've also, you know, studied in Bolivia. Um, but it, it's clear, I think, in the case of Brazil, and obviously clear in the case of Syriza, a key reason for that is those governments chose a more pragmatic strategy of conciliation with elites rather than confrontation and demobilization rather than mobilization. The Venezuelan case, at least through 2013, shows the advantages of a mobilizational strategy that actually arouses and continuously builds this popular movement. Um, so I think that's one positive lesson that we can take from Venezuela, but there's obviously contradictions of it. There's material contradictions. Um, a rentierist petrostate model is clearly not a sustainable way to build uh, left populism, much less democratic socialism. So a more diverse industrial uh, model would be a necessity. Um, charismatic leadership and the problem of leadership succession were not handled well in Venezuela. Um, and then the sort of question of the struggle within and against the state was allowed to flourish so long as they respected and tried to transform representative democracy. But once they got rid of that, the possibilities for that struggle uh, really, really diminished. All right, I'll leave it there and look forward to Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next up is Eric Palomares. Eric is a visiting researcher at the Center for Latin American Studies at the University of Copenhagen and a research associate for the Transformative Cities Project of the Transnational Institute. He has a PhD in government and public administration from the uh, Complutense University of Madrid and a master in development, innovation and change from the University of Bologna, Italy. Eric, welcome. Bienvenido. <laughs> Muchas gracias. Um, Thank you. 
eh, voy a presentar en español considerando que I am going to present in Spanish given that para, I have that opportunity a las traducturas I want to thank the translators difícil, no basta that con los dos it idiomas. is a hard job it's not enough to speak both languages de hecho, so thank he you un documento for doing that I've prepared a document that I will read la, bueno, les he pasado el documento a las traductoras and I've passed it along to them sí, facilitamos el trabajo so de yo intentaré hablar to make their work a little easier and um, I'll try to speak slowly que, bueno, voy a a ponerme a leer el documento. Eh, voy a presentar algunas reflexiones sobre... I'm going eh, to present some reflections nivel. on eh, change at local level. Minutos, During the next 20 minutes, I'll try to contribute to the conversation with some reflect, reflections conjunto, that we've developed Trumbo, alongside Sol Trumbo of the TNI and I through the three editions of the Transformative Cities Award and the Atlas of Utopia, facilitated by the Transnational Institute of TNI and implemented with five other international networks, the European Network for Community-Led Initiatives on Climate Change and Sustainability, Friends of the European National, Global Network of Continental Networks committed to the promotion of social solidarity economy, Habitat International Coalition, and the Global Platform for the Right of pero deben saber que estas no son reflexiones finales final porque el proyecto aún está en curso así que agradeceré, agradeceremos so enormemente los comentarios y sugerencias que puedan hacer el premio Ciudades Transformadoras y el Atlas de Utopías reconoce iniciativas locales que trabajan por garantizar el acceso al agua, a la energía, a la vivienda y a la alimentación and food. Lleva tres ediciones y pueden acceder a él en el enlace de la www.transformativecities.org. Una idea, esta es Just so you have an idea, internet. this is our website, pueden, eh, and Atlas you can go ¿Vale? through here to lo, the Atlas of hablaré. Utopias, which is um, what we're going to talk about. Este proyecto que se this inició project, hace cuatro años, ago, eh, relacionado precisamente con el inicio del proyecto de New Politics, project, eh, a este proyecto le interesa particularmente enfocarse en la ola de nuevas prácticas transformadoras a nivel local, el nuevo municipalismo level, que emergía con fuerza en muchas ciudades en Europa y la corriente de remunicipalización de servicios públicos que ha ido cada vez en aumento durante los últimos 20 años. El proyecto contempla una serie de preguntas de investigación a partir de las cuales se derivan las reflexiones que consideramos pueden ser de interés para ustedes. Estas preguntas pueden agruparse en tres ámbitos o temas generales. Primero, nos interesa saber cuáles han sido las estrategias utilizadas durante la movilización social para conseguir la satisfacción de estas demandas que creemos son esenciales para la supervivencia. Es decir, cómo han logrado articular una mayoría social en torno a las demandas concretas por agua, electricidad, vivienda y alimentación. En segundo lugar, nos interesa saber cuáles son las instituciones creadas y los derechos reconocidos, así como los mecanismos gubernamentales establecidos para que los mecanismos gubernamentales to Dicho satisfy de modo, these demands. Queremos saber In other words, cuál es esa nueva what is the new form of governance that has emerged from the alliance between social movements locales. and local governments? Y por último, Finally, pero más but most importantly, queremos encontrar la manera de contribuir al proceso de aprendizaje y la obtención de lecciones, identificar qué tipo de información puede ser relevante para quienes también luchan por la satisfacción de las demandas y de qué modo puede presentarse la información para que sea inteligible so that it's intelligible, despite the cultural and historical differences that characterize the various geographies of the planet. We want to offer this information in a disaggregated way, that is, in different forms, considering that those who participate in local politics are diverse actors with different logics, interests, rationalities, ethics, even epistemological assumptions. All of this because the plurality of context is also accompanied by the plurality of actors. Ahora bien, antes de compartir las reflexiones que tenemos Now, sobre estos tres grandes temas, voy a dedicar unos minutos a presentarles en qué consiste el premio de Ciudades Transformadoras y el Atlas de Utopías, para que tengan el contexto desde el cual derivamos nuestras conclusiones y por lo tanto también puedan juzgar sobre su validez o inconsistencia. El proyecto parte de una constatación empírica, es falso que no haya alternativas al modelo neoliberal dominante. El problema radica más bien en la diversidad, la dispersión y heterogeneidad de las muchas alternativas ya en marcha, así como 
las dificultades well cognitivas the para darle sentido y comprenderlas una vez que intentamos interpretarlas desde otro contexto local, definition different both culturally and El premio Ciudades Transformadoras y su relato de las utopías está concebido como un dispositivo metodológico para reconocer aquellas luchas sociales por la satisfacción de las demandas esenciales para la vida, el agua, la energía, la vivienda y la alimentación. Y el principal objetivo de la generación de conocimiento es que sea útil para quienes se encuentran en las mismas condiciones de satisfacción de las demandas esenciales y que quieran encontrar inspiración y aprendizaje en aquellas iniciativas que han tenido éxito. More successful es cierto que es sospechoso e incluso cuestionable que una organización como el Transnational Institute que reconoce la importancia de la colaboración horizontal de los movimientos de los participadores como parte de la transformación social propone un premio considerando los elementos de competencia y recompensa que suelen asociarse a una premiación. Sin embargo, este no es un premio de uso. Y la mejor manera de entenderlo es cambiando la palabra premio por la de reconocimiento. La palabra reconocimiento puede entenderse como cuando uno reconoce el esfuerzo a otro, así como un proceso de conocer o de explorar el esfuerzo de otros, como cuando uno hace un reconocimiento o de reconocimiento, como cuando uno hace un reconocimiento o de reconocimiento, como cuando uno hace un reconocimiento o de reconocimiento, como cuando uno hace un reconocimiento o de reconocimiento, como cuando uno hace un reconocimiento. Explican mejor el uso del premio como herramienta de aprendizaje. Por un lado, es verdad que se intenta dar un reconocimiento o un premio a aquellas iniciativas que han conseguido demostrar que es posible otro mundo posible. Pero es sobre todo la otra dimensión del reconocimiento, la de la exploración, la que es fundamental para entender este premio. Lo que se busca con el premio, por tanto, es poner en marcha un dispositivo digital que nos permita reconocer aquellas utopías reales en diferentes partes del mundo, aprovechando Echando el alcance internacional de Internet y las redes sociales, hacer un mapeo horizontal de iniciativas que luego esté a disposición del público y que puedan ser estudiadas y servir de inspiración. Además, el hecho de que sean las propias iniciativas las que apliquen el premio tiene impacto favorable en la calidad de la herramienta, ya que la muestra de estudio no está determinada de antemano por los investigadores, sino que es una muestra de algún modo aleatoria y alejada del típico sesgo que consiste en escoger los casos que mejor demuestran la teoría que apliquen. That one wants to test. Por lo tanto, el galardón o premio o reconocimiento no es ni un ranking de ciudades, ni mucho menos pretende hacer que las iniciativas compitan entre sí. Es más bien una herramienta de aprendizaje a través de la cual se intenta atender a las preguntas sobre qué y cómo pueden tanto investigadores como activistas y público en general aprender e inspirarse de esas iniciativas que son, por definición, distintas unas de otras. Por eso, cada uno de los componentes del premio, desde el formulario para rellenar hasta los relatos publicados sobre los finalistas, están pensados para ser de utilidad en el aprendizaje y posible réplica de las utopías reales. Si bien los contextos son distintos, la hipótesis subyacente es que los elementos técnicos de la prestación del servicio que se demanda, así como las estrategias de movilización, pueden ser transferidos a otros contextos. Esto asumiendo, por supuesto, que pese a las diferencias hay un contexto común, que es el neoliberalismo y la privacidad. There is a common context, which is that of neoliberalism and privatization, which have left communities without the services. The challenge, which is not only ours but of all tools for information exchange, the challenge is the translation of the information. 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 Que muchos de los movimientos sociales hacen lo que pueden. Somos conscientes de que la política real, situada de contingente, siempre está sometida a diversas correlaciones de fuerzas, en donde diferentes actores con diferentes recursos participan según dinámicas del pasado, en inglés se conoce como path dependence, y con diferentes aspiraciones de futuro. Aún así creemos que sí es posible mostrar diversos elementos que puedan ser útiles para otras y otros que están en la misma lucha. Para explicar esto mejor, eh, solemos eh, 
solemos recurrir a una metáfora. Eh, si todas las utopías reales que se desarrollan actualmente en el planeta fueran estrellas en el cielo, el Atlas sería un telescopio que enfoca ciertas constelaciones para verlas de cerca y entenderlas mejor. Hay muchas otras, por supuesto, y es bellísimo ver el cielo lleno de estrellas. Pero esto también puede ser un problema si, las queremos, si lo que queremos es verlas de cerca a todas. No tenemos ni el tiempo ni la capacidad, tanto física como cognitiva, para mirarlas todas de cerca. To look at them all up close. Así que le hemos pedido a un grupo de personas so distintas entre sí, pero todas comprometidas them, con el cambio social, a que nos ayuden a ajustar ese telescopio, to que nos ayuden a enfocar aquellas estrellas que valen la pena mirar de cerca y con detenimiento. Este grupo de personas lo constituye el jurado del premio. Uh, this group of people makes up the jury of the award, activists, academics, members of trade unions, international organizations who, through peer reviews, as with scientific journals, suggest which initiatives are worth looking at closely. Our biggest challenge has been to develop the form that the initiatives must fill up for their evaluation. We've tried to ask those questions that we believe may be of interest to the different actors of social change at a local level. So we ask questions that range from the communication Social, social mobilization strategies to those more related to the public policy Estos formularios, formulation. Por cierto, con la These forms, que han with the information filled out by the initiatives, are available for download Utopias. on todos, the todos uh, uh, Atlas of Utopias website. Ahora, también en la difusión de la información in hemos pensado siempre en la diversidad de lectoras y, lectoras y por ende la necesidad de ofrecer diferentes narrativas a lo que cada uno puede estar buscando. So what no queremos ofrecer un relato for. uniforme y cerrado sobre la solución al problema, sino diversos elementos abiertos a la interpretación, una especie de hermenéutica que considere la diversidad de contextos y actores de los cuales se va a leer la información disponible From which the information Ahora bien, on transforming cities award, ¿cuáles son esas reflexiones, hipótesis uh, o supuestos que hemos ido comprobando a lo largo de estos años del premio? A continuación hablaré de ellas award. divididas en tres grandes I'm áreas. About them in three reflexiones main areas. sobre la articulación de mayorías reflections sociales en torno a ciertas demandas social concretas. Around certain reflexiones sobre convertir, derech convertir en derechos esas demandas. demandas y por último, rights. reflexiones sobre And el gobierno de los movimientos sociales. Aunque, insisto, es un trabajo aún en proceso, Progress. Este año, por cierto, This tendremos year, la cuarta edición del premio y esperamos que todas y todos nos puedan ayudar con la difusión de esta edición, por cierto. Um, empecemos con las reflexiones sobre la articulación Now, de mayorías sociales en torno a ciertas demandas. Eh, consideramos que las categorías del premio son demandas necesarias para la vida, lo que llamamos survival politics, survival política politics. de la supervivencia. Todos necesitamos agua, water, comida, food, energía energy, y vivienda. And housing. Esto, creemos, favorece This la articulación de mayorías sociales en torno a estas demandas, debido particularmente a diferentes cuestiones. Por un lado, they share son that transversa they are transversales, transversal. son concretas they are y materiales, and material. y además, And no therefore, son identitarias, and moreover, they sino are que not interpelan a diferentes sectores. But they interpolate es decir, different sectors. son bienes y servicios In other words, que interesan a diferentes clases sociales sin importar su identidad classes, racial, sexual, sexual, de clase, sexual, etc. Or class identity. Además, eh, plantean la necesidad de actuar de forma local y comunitaria como respuesta al neoliberalismo. Esto es porque la lucha local por estos so servicios no es una opción estratégica, ¿no? como a veces se ha querido decir que lo local es una opción estratégica. En realidad, eh, en relación a estas demandas, se vuelve una necesidad It's a necessity, a, la a necessity that responds to the decentralization of public services produced after the structural reforms introduced by neoliberalism, which you know, we all know in the 80s, the structural reforms, what they did is they delegated to local governments the responsibility to attend to these demands, but they didn't give them the economic resources to satisfy them and created the conditions for their subsequent privatization due to the financial financial and technical inability of local governments to fulfill this responsibility. Eh, 
Por último, al ser parte de la estrategia neoliberal, Finally, encontramos el mismo escenario en todo el mundo. ¿no? Tanto en el norte como en el sur global, se comparte el problema de la privatización y mercatización de estos servicios públicos esenciales. Esto permite, por un lado, hacer análisis comparativos, pero por otro, ofrecer información práctica y útil para diferentes partes del mundo y crear la sensación de que es un problema compartido y que por ende se pueden generar las condiciones para una solidaridad tanto local como internacional. And international solidarity. Ahora pasaré a las eh, a la segundo grupo de reflexiones sobre I'm demandas que se convierten en derechos. Eh, la investigación se interesa no solo por la lucha del movimiento social, ¿no? ¿no? Es el momento social impugnatorio movements. o destituyente Understood en el cual los ciudadanos se van a la calle o exigen sus derechos. Pero también intenta conocer, so por un lado, cómo se ha conseguido la satisfacción de las demandas. Ese, digamos, ese sería ese otro momento constituyente o institucional en el que se garantiza los derechos y los institucional derechos en which rights are guaranteed and necessary resources are provided to guarantee the satisfaction of the lado, demands. Ver si se ha hecho de On the other hand, research also es tries decir, to understand que se consiga a través de la reinvención de la política local, donde la articulación social en torno a estas demandas consigue alterar la correlación de fuerzas de forma que son satisfechas de forma justa y democrática como derechos universales, no privilegios mercantiles y cuya institucionalización ha sido sentido común sobre la ausencia de alternativas por ejemplo, 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 la ausencia de alternativas contribuye a la irreversibilidad del cambio. Ante la pregunta sobre cómo hacer que los logros obtenidos no sean saboteados por el adversario, se puede entender a los derechos como la sedimentación de la lucha, convertida en instituciones o leyes que, si no imposibles, al menos si hagan difícil la vuelta atrás. También creemos que esta manera de pensar en los derechos se corresponde con la actual judicialización de la política, lo cual es de alguna manera which is understandable since the rule of law in contemporary democracies, the enforcement of the law is the last trench of politics. That is, it's the space where the democratic struggle is ultimately defined. Eh, daré Finally, las reflexiones sobre lo que entendemos como el gobierno de los movimientos sociales. Eh, eh, tres minutos. Gracias. Eh, la creemos que hay una ventaja comparativa del de gobierno frente a la autoorganización. Eh, y esto hay que decirlo con mucho cuidado para And que no, eh, no, no se malinterprete so eh, no como si uno quisiera comparar. ¿no? Lo único que creemos es que, them. y esto we se puede ver en el Atlas, ¿no? aunque en el Atlas hay iniciativas muy interesantes de autoorganización para la satisfacción de las demandas concretas de agua, energía, vivienda y alimentación, por ejemplo, la de Cochabamba en Bolivia, por ejemplo, en Cochabamba, en Bolivia, o en Oaxaca, en México. Cuando el gobierno se involucra, el alcance de la transformación se amplía, tanto por los recursos que se pueden invertir, como por la escala, como por la defensa de los derechos, ¿no? Y esto es de los derechos en lo que ya mencionaba previamente. Which is what I was mentioning previously. También creemos que al pensar en, los, eh, en esto de los gobier el, el gobierno de los movimientos sociales, nos plantea la necesidad de pensar en qué significa este nuevo o diferente ejercicio de gobierno, cuál sería esta gobernanza de los movimientos sociales, dando un paso más allá en relación a los debates sobre partidos de movimientos sociales, ¿no? que, hemos, en que se ha hablado de esto en esta, eh, en esta semana, sería ir más allá de hablar solo sobre los partidos, sino cómo sería ese about the parties, but what's it going to look once we get to government, what does governing sociales? mean by social Esto, movements? Lo que intenta también es plantear la dificultad, o que pensemos en la dificultad, the, de pasar de activista a administrador o elaborador de políticas públicas, ¿no? public policy eh, maker. Que, que es un rol distinto. Which es importante conocer cómo se construyen instituciones, cómo se establecen y defienden derechos, cómo se redistribuyen recursos y se prestan servicios públicos. En otras palabras, creemos que lo que hace falta words, es una escuela de gobierno que informe a los movimientos sociales sobre lo que se sabe del proceso de formulación de políticas públicas y sobre la administración pública local, local y sobre todo respecto a cómo puede ser distinto. Y también cómo puede ser distinto. Por último, bueno, dos cositas Finally, más y termino, porque ya se me ha acabado finish, justo el tiempo ahora. Eh, 
creemos que orientar, bueno, y esto era un poco también eh, lo que se hablaba al principio hoy, orientar el gobierno earlier. local a demandas Orienting concretas con las que reconoce el premio, creemos que se actúa eh, eh, si, trataré de hacer un super resumen si todo el objetivo es concreto de gobernar Creemos que al final lo importante de los esfuerzos es conseguir la satisfacción de la demanda, que no es otra cosa sino contribuir a la mejora de las condiciones esenciales para la vida de las personas. ¿no? Eh, por otro lado, una cosa que también hemos visto es que hay que tener cautela respecto a la actitud y predisposición para el cambio, tanto de parte de la burocracia local como de los sindicatos de servicios públicos. Porque aunque son aliados they indispensables, allies, también a veces son un impedimento importante. Eh, mencionar algunos casos, pero después podemos cases, hablar de ello. Y por último, y ya con eso termino, el problema de la reelección. The problem of re la lógica electoral de las the democracias neoliberales, que al final son las reglas de este juego que jugamos, obliga play, a plantear estrategias res respecto a la política de usual, el marketing electoral, usual, el clientelismo, los compromisos con adversarios. Pero hay que tener en opposition, cuenta que la reelección no la garantiza un partido fuerte o bien organizado. O, o bien organizado. La garantiza un It's buen gobierno. Es decir, That demostrando con resultados que se están cambiando las condiciones de vida de las personas. Are being y es precisamente sobre esto que la información, información generada por el premio generated by the Transformative y la Cities Utopias Award se espera por contribuir. Utopia's bueno, Atlas hopes termino. to contribute. Muchas gracias y de Thank verdad espero much. que cualquier comentario que tengan And I look se forward to all your commentaries. Muchísimas gracias, Eric. El proyecto es fascinante. Um, next up, uh, we have Kelly Okuno, our final speaker. Kelly is the co-founder and co-director of Cooperation Jackson in Mississippi. Kelly served as the special direct, the director of special projects and external funding in the mayoral administration of the late Chakwe Lumumba. His focus in this role was supporting cooperative development, the introduction of eco-friendly and carbon reduction methods of operation, and the promotion of human rights and international relations for the city. Kelly, welcome. Pleasure to be here, um, particularly in these very interesting and, and uh, turbulent times that uh, this discussion is, happens to be coinciding with here in the United States. Um, and we know uh, the impact of you know, what occurs here will have global impact. So very, very interesting time. Uh, first, let me say it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm, I'm very happy to be able to uh, feel well enough to, to be standing up today to be with everybody. Uh, and I, I miss um, participating throughout the week um, just because of some ongoing uh, health challenges I've been having, some major uh, uh, back issues, which in the context of COVID-19 um, has limited my ability to, to get them treated or even to have surgery, unfortunately. So I'm um, sorry I missed everything. Uh, I think it really would have uh, enriched me to participate, uh, to hear what others are thinking and how they're perceiving some of the things that are happening here and their impact globally. Um, that said, I think I would be remiss to not speak on uh, what is happening here uh, and to at least offer Uh, my two cents and perspective on on what's happening. Understanding it's a movement target, but uh, I think it speaks very clearly to the overall subject of efforts, both from uh, the left, our side of the equation, uh, and the right uh, here in the United States, um, uh, to transform it both uh, from above uh, and below. And one of the things I just wanted to really um, highlight, you know, in terms of earlier preparing comments uh, and thoughts to share here, most of that has been uh, just the last couple of days, just thrown out of, uh, just ripped up uh, because each day we're kind of finding out more details uh, and seeing the shifting and changing dynamics that are occurring uh, here, which speak to new Um, fractures and, and new alignments, um, you know, within the, the, the state, but with also within the, the ruling class that I think we have to do some deep interrogation of here in the United States uh, because they are shifting, they are afoot. 
uh, it's not quite clear where some certain things are going to land. Uh, but that being said, just to speak a couple of couple of quick things. Um, and um, my kids are in their school in the background, and maybe what you're what you're hearing. Uh, um, we, we're doing uh, education remotely here, and it also leads to, to interesting things. Um, so that being said, um, I first want to dispel the notion that uh, with Trump's departure and or removal, because both of those options are still on, on the table, that the uh, what we would call neo-Confederate politics the the type of economic nationalism and just white supremacy and revanchism that he was promoting that that is going to go anywhere sad to say it is not um it is i think he gave it a particular animus so there is some sub subjectivity to it but i think we would be remiss to not understand that what he did in fact was galvanize uh quite effectively for a short period of time uh, a number of right-wing forces and formed them into, I wouldn't say a coherent coalition, but at least for a time being an effective coalition. Uh, and I think the the acts of the last two or three weeks, or particularly the last two months, um, is consolidating them in ways which I think will be very deadly. Um, and I mean that quite literally. Uh, going forward uh, for the next couple of years. Um, and I think it's key to understand that he just kind of cobbled these forces together, but they were there and they existed on their own. Uh, and they have a, a tremendous organizing capacity and they had one long before he kind of uh, emerged on the scene. Um, I won't talk about all the dimensions of it because we just don't have the time, but I would uh, for folks to further study and understand if you're not familiar with it already, to look at the effort, which has been going on now uh, for several decades, but particularly gained a lot of ground uh, within the last 10 years. And that is this effort by the right wing uh, to call for and organize a constitutional convention uh, to transform and, and overwrite in, uh, uh, the United States Constitution. Um, that effort before Donald Trump, and in part during his, you know, uh, four-year reign, uh, already had, I think by 2016, uh, they had already captured 25 uh, state capitals, just the state legislatures, uh, this being the Republican Party and allied forces with those, and initiated processes to transform uh, the, the, the Constitutional Convention. And by 2018, uh, they had 28, and what they would need to really call the question and, and do the writing is, is only 34, 34 states. So as of 2018, they were only uh, six states short of their overall goal and objective. Now, we have to put this in context to understand that this was an effort in the movement that preceded Trump being in his office, and it's one of the different types of movements that he kind of rode the coattails uh, of uh, to enter into the framework. And we have to remember that, um, you know, despite his loss, uh, another factor, despite his loss, you know, there were 73 plus million people who actually voted for him. That's more people who voted for uh, almost any other president in history uh, outside of uh, Biden this election. Uh, and that's nearly 50% of the electorate. And by all measures, in all accounts, all the different kind of uh, gathering of information to this point, uh, there are 60%, 60 to 70% of those who voted for Trump believe that the election was fraudulent and stolen. Uh, and some of the polling I've seen this morning and last night indicates that there's over 50% uh, of that same uh, uh, electorate body which believe that the efforts to, I think we have to call it a coup most clearly now, to support the coup efforts that happened uh, on January 6th, over 50% actually supported that initiative and are giving a lot of support to ongoing efforts and ongoing calls um, for there to be a radical kind of rearticulation of government 
uh, coming from them from, from below primarily, right? So we have to look at this, I think, very clearly uh, in regards to what is the right doing right to organize this level of forces here in the United States to be able to not only win state legislatures, you know, uh, pretty profoundly, the majority of them, uh, but to also now be able to marshal, I guess, our variant of, of brown shirt forces uh, and clearly some level of support within factions of the armed forces. We're not quite clear to what degree or to what extent uh, that goes. And I don't think we would know uh, really until by the 20th of where that really stands. I, for one, believe that the top brass uh, of the Pentagon uh, is firmly against any effort uh, to profoundly alter bourgeois democracy here in the United States. Um, it has worked too well and been too successful to just abandon, uh, I think, at this point for them and for their interests. Uh, but I do think and I do know from, from a, a lot of our work here on the regional level um, that there's been a concerted move of, of a number of reactionary forces to both enter into uh, the U.S. military, not only for the purpose of training, uh, which is a long tradition down here in the South in particular, but also uh, for some strategic placement. Uh, and we will see to what degree some of the middle rank uh, are able to, to potentially make some moves or, or, or engage in certain kind of maneuvers over the course of starting tomorrow and, and over the course of the next couple of days. Um, we haven't seen anything of this nature uh, really in the United States, you know, there was a brief period in time uh, in the 1930s uh, where fascist, pro-fascist forces um, made some efforts, some organized efforts to organize a coup, uh, was exposed and defeated. Uh, and before that, you'd have to basically go back uh, to the period of uh, the, the redemption governments and the end of Reconstruction. So we haven't seen it anything like this in the United States in quite some time. It's rather unprecedented. And how this is going to shake out uh, is, is almost anyone's guess. Now, on the other side of the uh, uh, equation, I think we can already um, clearly kind of see that in order to fulfill the mission, that they've set out for themselves this, this cycle uh, in the form of, of uh, Biden and the forces that put him in, in alignment of restoring any kind of normalcy um, to the country and to the political theater, that that is going to bend as a result of what has happened in the last two months. That is actually going to bend towards the right. It is not going to bend towards the left. Um, and for folks who are thinking that they're going to, there's going to be some major opportunity for uh, universal health care to be really put forward or uh, eliminating student debt or major relief uh, around the pandemic, uh, both in terms of, of any kind of income security uh, or um, moratoriums on evictions and things of that nature, uh, that will likely only be at best uh, short term, um, because there's there's many signs and there's many warnings and many threats uh, already that the the new kind of effort uh, that that uh, Biden even announced uh, was it yesterday uh, was I think it's one point seven trillion dollar kind of proposal uh, to kind of re resort things uh, that there's been some negative market reaction a number of particularly hedge fund uh, discussions already are indicating that this could totally result in a bubble that will crash and are already liking several of them that I listened to uh, uh, late last night and early this morning, uh, uh, a crash very similar to what took place in 1929, overshadowing what we just experienced in 2008. So this is clearly on the agenda and something that we're going to have to contend with. Um, what I think we're going to see and what we're going to have to see uh, from a left perspective uh, is a, a profound retreat. And I hate to call it that, but I don't know what else to call it, I think, in the context. But a profound retreat back to uh, uh, municipal uh, politics and municipal efforts 
to really gain some critical ground in light of what's going to, to likely play out the next four years. Given the limitations that we know of a 50-50 split in the Senate, given how much power we know on the, on the federal level, it's still going to be wielded by Mitch McConnell and the right to, to not only shape uh, Biden's cabinet, but shape the overall policies. The shift is going to have to devolve back down to the states and back down to the municipal levels. Uh, and on that level, unfortunately, I don't think uh, we've built throughout the country the, the muscles to really move in that direction or pivot in that direction fairly quickly. Um, in part, just because I would say particularly the last two or three years, two in, in particular, uh, a lot of the overall left's focus has been towards uh, removing Donald Trump from office, uh, almost in a singular fashion. Um, and uh, unfortunately, a lot of the down, what we call in the United States, the down ballot efforts uh, were really missed out. And you, you can see this most, most clearly, I think, in Pennsylvania, where Biden won, uh, but the right on the state level uh, gained some critical ground. Um, the kind of one indicator going in the opposite direction, at least on the state level, was Georgia, uh, which was pretty profound and does need to be studied, I think, in some detail. Uh, but it's an outlier, an exception to the rule uh, in the main of what I think took place uh, uh, in 2020 on the elections. Um, and I do think, uh, given where uh, the movement, I think, has matured here in the United States, the left movement has matured over the course of the last two years, that I think within a year's time, we'll be able to make some critical pivots back towards the municipal level. And in that regard, I do think uh, our experience here in Jackson over the last 10 years could be very instructive to large sectors uh, of the left who are looking to, to engage us, particularly, I would say, in small to mid-sized uh, towns, um, you know, where there are clear uh, working class organizations and where there are clearly articulated uh, um, Black, uh, Latino, Indigenous, uh, and people of color coalitions and organizations uh, that are rooted both in mass work and mass struggle. You, you got to give me a minute, G. Okay. Um, um, who are clearly articulated in that are doing a combination both of um, organizing around many of the key issues of the day. I think the pandemic and the responding, uh, the corresponding economic threats that come from that are going to be critical, I think, towards rearticulating a new municipal politics in the near future. Um, and then I think the other uh, piece is going to be folks who've already learned and already been engaging on a certain level of at least uh, get out the vote kind of efforts in the course of the past couple of years. That's going to be critical just in terms of uh, what level of context, what level of databases and what level of mobilization capacity has been built. Uh, so in this respect, I think there is some potential effort to, to really hold off uh, many of the, the worst elements of the neoliberal restoration that, that Biden promises. And I think some potential effort at some major transformation, if we can develop a, a coherent politics uh, to deal with the, 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 the current crisis that are rooted in, in mutual aid, worker self-organization, uh, broad democratic practices uh, on a communal level, uh, in regards to like people's uh, 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 assemblies or other kind of popular assemblies uh, to develop our overall democratic capacity. These, I think, kind of lead the way uh, towards a broader long-term transformative politics uh, here in the United States, which I think could be you know, very profound over the course of the next five to 10 years in both countering um, uh, the, the serious degrees of Austerity we know are coming down the pipeline um, just as a result of, of where things are at both globally uh, and domestically on the economic front and how they're going to have to try to balance accounts uh, at the end of the day uh, and then be a good critical measure of self-defense uh, against uh, the ongoing attacks of the right, which I don't think unfortunately going to uh, stop. If anything, sadly, uh, hate to be the bearer of bad news, but I think uh, we are going to see in the United States replays basically of, unfortunately, 
uh, the 1860s and 70s, which saw the rise of uh, these kind of vigilante forces like the Ku Klux Klan and the Citizens Councils, the White Knights, things of that, those natures. I think the organized forces of the right, um, they're going to respond in that way to more of the kind of the Lone Ranger or more regional variants of kind of expressing power and exerting terror on, on our communities uh, because they're not fully equipped to deal with the overwhelming uh, might of, of the federal government in terms of uh, the FBI and the overall capacity of the surveillance state uh, unless they make some major inroads in transforming it, uh, which is a possibility, slight, but a possibility. Um, so it's a mixed bag here in the United States, I think, right now, um, where you can definitely see um, things going from, from our perspective in the right direction. Uh, I think if we look at, for instance, the kind of overall balance sheets of 2020, we could see that it was one of the most remarkable uh, um, years for social movements here in the United States, uh, particularly in light of uh, what was emerging in the, 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 the kind of major uh, spontaneous, for the most part, uh, efforts of workers to defend themselves uh, in the midst of the pandemic. So there was a pretty significant strike wave that we haven't seen in the United States basically um, from March through June and then the Floyd Rebellion, which is the largest sustained kind of protest movement we've seen in the United States since the 1930s. So I'll stop there just in the interest of time. Thank you so much, Kelly. It's fascinating. Um, we're moving on to the Q&A part and I wanna thank all of our panelists for some really interesting presentations. Thanks to everyone who is speaking there. That was incredibly thought provoking. And a particular thank you to Callie for joining us. Your analysis is, well, it's always so sharp and I really hope you feel better soon. Um, but I've got a couple of questions for Katharina. Uh, so first, great paper. I was particularly interested in your emphasis on how the EU imposes a transformation on nation states. I mean, this chimes a lot with uh, some of the things that me and James have been thinking about and writing uh, about in our own paper, uh, where we were arguing that the EU is not so much a super state bureaucracy um, as it is a mechanism for empowering national governments against domestic democratic forces. Uh, and I was wondering if you could expand a bit on, well, on how leftist and democratic forces relate to institutions like the EU, and conversely, what role do you think popular sovereignty plays in leftist programs? And then finally, on a political level, how do we claim a genuinely internationalist perspective that doesn't rely on elite treaties and trading regimes and so on? So that's my questions. Katerina? So your question, Pete, was how leftists and democratic forces relate to the EU. Well, I think it depends on what leftists and what democratic forces you're talking about. Um, so uh, in, in, um, in, in Portugal, as an example, it, uh, it varies. Um, so the, the Communist Party in Portugal, which is still a, a very present party in our political system, is, has uh, the most, uh, I would say, um, the strongest and even in many ways most coherent analysis towards the EU, the left bloc, which I think is a position that is shared by most of these broad left parties, has a, let's say, wobbly <laughs> position. So it did change um, in, uh, in 2014, 2015, with all the memoranda that was imposed on Greece and, and on Portugal and also on Ireland in a little bit a different way. Um, that, that moment also opened up a space for a more Euro skeptical and Euro critical position, um, but to but but the but the the problem is going from a critique to actually um, making proposals concrete on what to do with it. Um, so and then other democratic forces. I mean, if you look at um, the other parties on the political spectrum the social liberals uh, or the more conservative conservative liberals, they are all very uh, EU pro EU prone parties. Um, so we, we don't actually have a very strong right wing uh, nationalist sort of party as you can see in Portugal, as you can see in other countries. Uh, so we don't have a, a right wing 
perspective on the EU, except for some uh, very small groupings. Um, um, uh, so and I, I think that the difficulty here has been for the left, how exactly to relate with it. So coming from an analysis uh, of the EU as being a neoliberal project that is actually a space of the encounter of the oppressors and not of the oppressed um, from actually um, uh, making proposals concrete, because I do believe that concerning the EU, and this is particularly real after the global financial crisis, the, there is a real contradictory consciousness about belonging to the EU. So people, uh, the popular feeling is that we, um, uh, ba very bad things come from the EU, but also uh, people, there's a majority a popular feeling that you can never leave because you're so dependent on that. So how, how would you deal as a small peripheral economy such as Portugal? And I think, I think Greece um, had a little bit of this uh, contradictory uh, feeling as well. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's the million dollar question. How do you exactly relate with this? And I believe that um, the only possibility is to assert uh, the criticism and not go back with it when, when the moment is not the best, um, but is to focus your political agenda on political demands that should be possible to be implemented at the level of the nation state, as for example, uh, 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 renegotiating the debt or um, uh, public control of the strategic sectors of the economy, a public bank, banking sector, and so on. So which are, or the re refinancing, refunding um, the social state, uh, both uh, the, the, the public health system or education and social security. Um, because those, those proposals make sense. I think we can still build majorities around them, but they are, in fact, proposals that will clash with the EU as such, because you actually cannot do it. You need instruments to do those things that you don't have because the EU has sort of taken them away from, from us. But of course, this is not taken them away from us. I mean, this is also, this is the difficulty, is this double dynamic. It's, this is both um, a, an imperialist project, so a, a capitalist project, but it's also a project where different national bourgeoisies are also competing with one another. And that's, I think that's this double dynamic is what makes it difficult. Um, and you had another question. Well, I forgot, sorry. I mean, that was really, you've certainly covered it. Thank okay. you. Okay, <laughs> cool. Um, all right. Uh, the next question uh, will be from Lucio and I want to uh, just remind people to keep questions very short and answers very short. We only have 21 minutes left. Bueno, me ha gustado mucho la exposición de eh, múltiples I've experiencias really locales que, que sí es importante recoger. Eh, quisiera preguntarles a los here. que las expusieron y si han hecho el intento, si han conocido intentos de relacionar esas experiencias con una visión estratégica más amplia de relaciones de fuerzas, de cómo acumular poder popular para una política más, eh, más general, tanto nacional como internacional. Si conocen eh, las dificultades que implica esa relación, Eric, or tal vez uh, Cali. Exactly, for them too. Cali, please. I think your experience is very interesting. So, so if you can please go ahead. Yes. Um, the answer is yes, but, but with profoundly mixed results, you know, being honest. Um, the latest expression of that, both on a national and international level, uh, emerging uh, from our organization is the effort um, to address the, the, the pandemic um, and to try to situate it in a way that, that has, that, deal, that addresses this global uh, uh, economic and social political impacts. 
uh, and that's been a coalition effort that's, that's uh, emerged as the people strike. Uh, and one of the things that uh, it was declaredly trying to move towards was uh, uh, organizing towards a general strike, but not one of a, in a new profound sense was doesn't just deal with, um, you know, halting production at, at site, at source, uh, but to deal with other circulations of capital. So uh, rent, um, you know, being another critical one, but also activities around shopping uh, and folks attending school and, and trying to, to mobilize uh, the masses of people to engage in that level. Uh, and it had some initial success, but I think really ran into um, some major problems once the election season really kind of kicked in. And we didn't have a kind of a coherent agreement or strategy within the coalition on how to relate to the elections and particularly how to relate to the Democratic Party and the Biden, Biden presidency or Biden candidacy at that time. Uh, other efforts uh, in that vein, which are earlier, um, you know, we've had a tremendous amount of uh, friction and, and tendency within our own ranks here locally uh, and in the national organizing efforts uh, to build an independent political force and have just run into a numerous obstacles time and time again on how we navigate, you know, the Democratic Party and all the different uh, efforts uh, within that. Where we've had, I think, our most success has been in very limited campaigns. Mm -hmm. Um, take on, you know, um, this particular issue or that particular threat, uh, but, but in coming together to form a coherent strategy, um, the efforts, our efforts have been, I think, very limited, and I think that's the general dynamic of the left uh, in the United States with all of its different fractures. So if you look at uh, some of these debates are mirrored within the DSA, you know, which is uh, right now by far and away the largest uh, concentration of left forces in the United States. Uh, but if you look at um, uh, the movement for black lives, uh, which is the, the most coherent and largest body that has kind of emerged out of the black lives uh, movement over the past several years, uh, this same debate, uh, particularly around how do you relate to the Democratic Party, uh, I think has been one of the central features uh, that kind of constitutes a dividing line that inhibits the kind of overall strategy uh, for us to move. And it's going to be one of the long-term questions that I think we're going to have to try to figure out here in the United States to make some critical advances. Thank you, Kelly. Eric, quisiera uh, agregar algo? Yes, mm. briefly, so I can hear more contributions. Quizá. Um, Lo que habría que reflexionar es cuando, cuando hablamos o planteamos la idea de estrategia, que la propia definición de estrategia involucra tener objetivos. Es decir, si queremos pensar o reconocer experiencias en las cuales diferentes in which agrupaciones, movimientos, or eh, actividades eh, locales se reunieron level, estratégicamente, habría que pensar para qué, cuál, cuál es el objetivo why, para el cual se reunieron, y a partir de ahí quizás podremos hacer distinciones, porque, and then maybe we can make por ejemplo, si for example, lo que queremos pensar es sobre estrategias about about electorales ¿no? para poder ganar a nivel eh, to nacional, be able to win on a national or state que level. Sí que podemos encontrar algunas experiencias muy there, interesantes. We can find a lot of interesting me viene, experiences. Lo primero que me viene a la cabeza, por the ejemplo, first thing I think of es el caso del PT en Brasil. Is the eh, case of the PT porque in Brazil. lo que no, el, el, la idea de los presupuestos participativos que empezaron en Porto Alegre o lo que hizo Patru Sananas en, en, en Belo Horizonte fueron experiencias del PT previas al PT a nivel nacional. Eh, de hecho, me permito recomendar un libro level. que edita I, I precisamente book Daniel Chávez, que está aquí, eh, que se llama La izquierda en la ciudad, que lo que plantea precisamente es eso, como en América Latina, antes de, antes de que existieran los gobiernos que nosotros ahora, de los que nosotros hablamos, como los gobiernos populares en Bolivia, en Ecuador, en había habido ya antes, desde los 90, experiencias a nivel local. Entonces, eh, 
yo dejaría eso ahí, pero luego me preguntaría también so eh, hand, qué pasa cuando, myself, cuando los objetivos no son esos. Eh, y me viene también a la mente lo que ha pasado ahora en España con los llamados Spain, gobiernos del cambio, eh, con las ciudades del cambio. Por, porque eh, antes, digamos, cuando surge Podemos, antes Because de que fueran las elecciones, las primeras elecciones generales, the first general eh, elections hubieron las Podemos, elecciones locales o municipales. Local or municipal y entonces elections. vimos un gran logro ¿no? con los famosos gobiernos de Adacolao en Barcelona o en Madrid o en otras ciudades en Barcelona, importantes en Madrid, como Cádiz, que es la única que se mantiene. Cádiz, pero el resto that's han maintained. perdido la reelección. De hecho, no olvidemos que Adacolao perdió. Si Adacolao Ada Ada se mantiene en el gobierno en Barcelona, es solamente porque, y aquí aprovecho para conectar con algo que decía Catarina sobre el sistema electoral parlamentario, es que, mientras que en América Latina el sistema presidencial permite distinguir que aquellos que ganan son los que tienen más votos, en el sistema parlamentario cuenta ¿no? eh, eh, juntar, juntar los representantes que ya han sido electos, que fue más o menos lo que pasó en Barcelona. ¿no? Es decir, el voto para Ada Colau cayó y lo único que permitió que se mantuviera en el gobierno pues fue que la correlación de fuerzas entre ¿no? los que no querían ser catalanistas y compañía le dieron el gobierno. Entonces, eh, ellos sí que intentaron comunicarse entre sí para crear una especie de, 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 de diálogo entre ciudades pero lo que vemos es que no cities, Ahora, la pregunta out. es, ¿es el objetivo electoral el is único que tendría que marcar nuestra estrategia? The only one that should y, y yo creo que, que, que ahí es donde yo creo And que I también tiene mucho que ver lo que también decía Catarina hace rato sobre saying, relacionar lo que queremos hacer con lo que de verdad puede hacer el Estado, ¿no? Y que era un poco lo que yo planteaba do. en la presentación sobre lo que estamos nosotros creyendo. Eh, hay cosas que como There en el caso things, del agua o de, like eh, water, o de la vivienda o de la energía uh, le corresponden al gobierno local energy, por lo tanto toca hacer la lucha so es muy local difícil so digamos, promover la relación estrategica entre otros gobiernos locales para hacer una demanda cuando eh, lo que se busca, el objetivo de la estrategia for, está orientado a que el gobierno local sea quien lo responde. Creo, y ya con esto termino, que precisamente la Unión Europea, eh, sin, sin, no quiero pegar a ser eurocéntrico, I mean, I'm pero not trying to be creo que la Unión Europea here, en esto I think the sí que nos permite Union jugar con esta eh, posibilidad de relacionarnos entre gobiernos locales, I mean, porque local al haberse creado este nivel supranacional, sí que hay una especie de relación ya directa entre kind of lo que se determina a nivel supranacional europeo, eh, como lo que se ha debatido hace poco sobre la, la posibilidad de privatizar we ciertos servicios públicos, con services, la idea de que ahora sí puede haber una relación entre gobiernos locales en toda Europa que puedan juntarse para luchar contra la Unión Europea. Dicho de otra forma, para conectar con lo que se hablaba ayer sobre el conflicto, que exista un enemigo en común que es la Unión Europea enemy, es el que debería permitir que haya una relación entre los gobiernos locales. Ahora, tratando local de atender a la pregunta, y now, he dicho, creo, creo que ya he dicho más de cuatro veces que con esto termino y no termino. That, eh, pero eh, respecto a los casos, creo que, creo que lo que queda pendiente y que creo que vamos bien, pero vamos poco a poco, es cómo crear estos vínculos, esta especie de foro social mundial de los noventas, ahora aprovechando la tecnología con la que contamos. Now with the me da la impresión de que aún no, have, no, no, no suceda alguna cosa así tan clara. That something eh, as clear as that ¿Por qué no lo sé? Pero yo eh, Why, I don't eh, know. veo intentos, pero no veo algo así I'm tan ambicioso como lo fue el social forum was creo que um, on the local que level. Sería ambicioso e and interesante I think proyectar that would como to project as a strategic objective. Um, next up, um, I'm going to ask Mabel and Agnes to ask their questions back to back and for the answers and the questions, everything to be very condensed because we need to get to audience questions. Bueno, primero, gracias a los panelistas que fueron realmente Thank excepcionales. Thank you to the panelists who were all exceptional. Me, me It's one of the más. panels that este, most was interesting Gabriel, to me. 
Catarina, Eric, Cali, Gabriel, no, Eric y Cali, you were all absolutely brilliant centrales. and Una you put very que, important points eh, on the table. Mario, si A hizo, question that was taken es, up by several of you is how to construct a so democratic de, socialism de o sea, when it's in terms of dispossessing the possessors of fighting with the reactionary forces that impede social transformation that requires a lot of force and fighting and at the same time being democratic in the maximum expression of the field. That's a tension that all real socialism has had and it's one of the main difficulties. So what I want to ask is How do you think or imagine the possibility of fighting against the state, starting getting concessions from the state to transcend the state, knowing that with political power of the state, it's very difficult to move forward, as all experiences indicate, towards greater transformation? That's a question for everyone, but since Gabriel hasn't answered a question, it would be great to hear um, with the Venezuelan experience. Also, Catarina, who was very Gracias. brilliant in her presentation. Thank you. Uh, next, Agnes, and then I'm going to um, maybe ask Gabe or whoever else to answer. Um, can you maybe type your question in the comments, in the chat? Now, um, Gabe, I don't know if you wanted okay. to. Sure. So, yeah, I understand, Agnes, they're asking you to just type the question because we can't hear you. Um, so thanks, Mabel. Uh, very quickly on the previous question, I think um, the experience of Torres in Venezuela also speaks to how to sort of ramp up the local. Um, and they tried it in two ways. The sort of Torres became a model, like explicitly so for other municipalities within Venezuela, even within Latin America, and to some extent in the US. Julio Chavez traveled to Chicago and other cities in the US. He traveled to cities in Ecuador and sort of said, this is what we did. We did a municipal constitution. We did a you know, radical participatory budget. You should try it here too. Here's a correlation of forces. Um, you know, it wasn't like a mechanistic model, but they took it and they said, you know, try it in other places. So um, Porto Alegre, I think did a similar thing, but you know, th there's ways that can happen. Um, and a second thing, which I think was uh, exciting, but similar to what Kali said, um, it didn't work ultimately was a radical faction within the ruling United Socialist Party of Venezuela, an explicit attempt in 2010 and 2011 to create a leftist faction within the, um, within the party. And Chavez, Hugo Chavez, uh, basically sort of shut it down. And he had this sort of more Leninist, you know, view of party unity. Uh, we have to have that to fight the right. It's somewhat understandable, but I think it had an unfortunate consequence. So that goes to Mabel's Wonderful question. Um, how do you, you know, how do you democratize uh, radically while defeating a right wing reaction in which your efforts to preserve and transform representative democracy may well strengthen your enemies and allow them to defeat you and build forces? I think we saw this, you know, in Chile under Allende that, you know, respecting bourgeois democracy gives tools to the enemies on the right who are willing to dispense with bourgeois democracy. So that's you know one argument people in Venezuela have. It's not totally unreasonable. We can't have bourgeois democracy because if we have it, the bourgeoisie will vanquish us and they'll get rid of it um, ourselves. And there's plenty of evidence that they've tried to do that in Venezuela. I mean, they've done coups against Chavez. They've tried coups against Maduro. Um, they've tried invasions. They've you know supported you know Venezuelan opposition sectors supporting U.S. sanctions. I think that you know the tentative answer that I would uh, give to that is that, you know, building popular power within and against the state, as I was saying, is the answer. It's not a magic bullet. It doesn't eliminate the contradictions. It doesn't eliminate the problems. Um, but if you fail to do that, I think that you lead to Sovietization. There was a question in the sort of Q&A box about this. I think that has happened in Venezuela. I think that um, the risks of getting rid of representative democracy in Venezuela appear to be equal or greater than the risks of preserving it. Um, so I think that you, you know, build a base of popular power. Um, I think ultimately you have a project of, you know, trying to build and radicalize a form of leftist hegemony. I think if you can actually build a really solid popular base that believes in a project that can see that project here, I'll agree with Kelly. I think that 
you know, you have to have a lot of local expressions of it. They can be really utopias in Eric Dolan Wright's sense, concrete fantasies in a Gramscian sense. You know, a, a lot of the experiments that Eric was talking about, you know, happening, you stitch them together, you radicalize them, you connect them to a discourse um, at the national level, and you continuously fight against that. And, you know, to theorize this, I'll give one final concept and then, you know, turn it back over. I think that an idea that worked well in Venezuela was what I think about as refraction. Um, so you take elements of the dominant discourse and you utilize them, but in new ways. Um, and I think that that's what happened in Torres, where they took the you know, Bolivarian process, but they really stitched it to a genuinely democratic uh, socialist project. They stitched it to real expressions of popular power. You would constantly see ordinary citizens you know, using the discourse of Chavez against Chavista officials who were not living up to that discourse. Um, and I think you can do that in so many places. You can do that in the U.S. I think that Bernie's, you know, one of the brilliant things he's done is repeatedly uses Trump's own rhetoric to say, well, actually, the Democrats should be fulfilling these popular demands. We should be fulfilling, you know, $2,000. We should be fulfilling whatever, um, but obviously stitching it to a very, very different project. So it doesn't get rid of the contradictions Mabel was talking about. It doesn't fix everything. But I think that that's ultimately the solution, preserving the representative democracy, radicalizing it, pushing it beyond. Um, and then you get to different problems, which we'll have to think about. All right, um, we have Agnes's question in the chat. Um, her question to Callie is, one might guess that in a situation where you have a Biden government and a fascist counter movement, the same effect that previously propelled left movements to mainstream visibility in the context of the democratic campaign will now work to push left voices to align with Biden and silence transformative aspects. In these conditions, is there a realistic organizational option you see to promote the direction you propose? And I'll also add a question from the get, uh, from the, the um, a, a viewer, uh, Kolya Abramsky, um, which I know is interesting for the Jackson experience. As a right wing in the US, return to the language and politics of the Confederacy to the center stage of national politics is or should the left returning to some variant or other of the common turn black belt position on self-determination or is this a dead end? Two heavy questions. <laughs> um, well, first let me say I, I come out of the black belt uh, orientation and position. Um, and our project, overall project, was framed uh, kind of on that historical model. Um, I, th I think the, the proof of it, um, oddly enough, was kind of best expressed uh, in what just happened in Georgia. Um, but that's a left variant of it. Uh, there are right variants of it, which I wouldn't endorse or support in any form or fashion. Um, so I, I, I think it demonstrates its potential, but getting to leading into what, what um, how the two blend together, the two questions, what Agnes framed. Um, unfortunately, Agnes, I don't see that we at present uh, have the organizational uh, capacity um, to move in that way, at least in a coherent sense. Uh, what will emerge, I think, uh, just given the dynamics of uh, the left in the United States, both the social movement left and what's kind of what remains of the party left, what is going to take place in what I described are very autonomous, very kind of disconnected and isolated local movements that are going to emerge. Uh, and then I think the struggle will be um, trying to connect them in the way that Gabriel, I think, just mentioned. That's going to be one of the critical pieces. But, uh, you know, let me be candid and say that I think um, even before um, the 6th of, of uh, January, before last week, um, myself and many others have been kind of trying to issue some warnings uh, about the potential, very real potential of the, the Biden administration uh, to do everything it could to it can to split uh, the social movement that emerged uh, and, and gave fire to so much uh, energy uh, in 2020. 
and and the call that he had with you know a good number of quote unquote kind of respected or institutional uh, black leaders uh, in early uh, December, I think it was December eighth. Uh, he very clearly you know stated that that was uh, kind of the crux of how he was going to relate to the movements, uh, and that was of of two natures: either number one, kind of get your folks under control. Uh, and tamper down their demands, right? So the, you, you got to kind of put an end to this demand uh, to defund the police or to uh, eliminate the police uh, because they saw that as being too threatening and, and potentially costing them uh, several congressional seats uh, uh, and other down ballot races. So a saying to the NAACP and many others, you know, quiet that down and, and, and put that down as soon as you can. Uh, and if you can't do that, then of course we will deal with it in other main other ways. Historically, those other ways have been very dictatorial and repressive, um, and we we really wouldn't expect them to do anything else. Quite honestly, now how this is actually going to play out in in the face of uh, a very clear and I think now uh, folks agree that, that there's a full on you know fascist uh, movement aiming to aspire to to power. Uh, I think there will be a immediate period of all progressive and left-leaning forces rallying uh, uh, to the banner of trying to preserve democratic, you know, uh, uh, bourgeois democracy. Uh, but um, I don't think that that will last long. And I'll end here. I just, I, I sadly don't think that that will last long uh, because of of basically how the the austerity is going to have to kind of roll out. I think by the summer and the fractures that that's going to cause in the social movement, I think that will definitely leave uh, Biden to have to do some some serious repressive measures to make to maintain control first against the right, but then ultimately against the left as the mass movement begins to reemerge and demand more uh, of his administration and of the local governments, local and state governments. Um, well, I think we are basically uh, out of time. Oh, wait, no, there was one more thing. Uh, Eric, ¿tú quieres decir algo sobre el comentario de Mabel? Rápidamente, porque me parece muy interesante, Mabel, lo que has presentado, pero uh, si pudieras posar una respuesta said, muy breve, If I could say something diría very que la manera en la que se puede ir más allá de esas, o ir más allá de las cuestiones, que planteas es a través de la ley, que ¿no? es un poco law, lo que planteamos sobre los derechos. Me eh, da la impresión de que eso era además lo que estaba detrás de los intentos latinoamericanos de crear en las asambleas constituyentes nuevas constituciones en las que se planteara precisamente el problema de la redistribución, porque al final redistribution la ley nos iguala, pero no solo nos iguala, sino que justifica tanto las penalidades como la redistribución. Quizás el problema sería, y es algo que the problem, últimamente he estado be, reflexionando, no tengo, pregunta, grapple, no tengo una respuesta, pero por eso no tengo una respuesta que lo hayas planteado, es, es, es quizás lo que tendríamos que plantearnos es cuál es la transmisión de justicia. Is, eh, what is the conception y creo of justice. que hay una oportunidad muy interesante an en lo que hay ahora sobre la right lucha por una transición, eh, eh, una transición ecosocial que sea sustentable y justa. Creo que nos hace volver a pensar cuál es nuestra propia idea de justicia. Porque creo que desde el trabajo de John Rawls sobre justicia, John Rawls eh, work on justice, hemos ido dejando We've been leaving eh, behind a, a the idea of justice. Creo que We've left it to liberalism. Queda un pendiente esa idea de qué And I think that's something we really need to think about. What does a just y que creo and que tiene que ver sustainable con la transition look like? And that has to do with the justification of those laws that in a rule of law, in a democracy, would allow us to mark the penalizations to take from some who have a lot to give to others que es la redistribución y la igualdad, is, la ley nos hace iguales. ¿Vale? Perdón, pero esto me parece muy interesante. Me parece muy interesante. Perdón, pero creo que es realmente interesante. Caterina, ¿quieres hablar? Sí, solo unos breves comentarios sobre algunas cosas. Creo que es interesante lo que Eric dijo sobre el nivel subnacional y el nivel supranacional y esta idea del encuentro de diferentes estados y el enemigo común. Well, I think the problem is precisely and this is what we've been facing, and this is why it's so complicated, is that to even get into power, 
to even get sort of a left government that could build this common enemy, um, uh, you have to deal with the constraints imposed by that common enemy. So you can't, and, and the, the fact is that you can't fully win state power without already confronting that common enemy because it imposes so many measures uh, of, of uh, disciplinary measures and loss of so sovereignty that it is, in, you know, you, we can't just, it's not possible to gain full state power without already having direct confrontational um, uh, demands posed uh, and conflicts, open conflicts with the EU. And then I think to Mother, I think it's interesting because it also links to uh, something that Gabriel said in his presentation about the left in power and the strategies of mobilization or demobilization. I think, I think Greece, um, is an interesting example of um, a left-wing party that got into power by the strength of its social movements, namely this, all the solidarity networks that existed to give an answer that the state wasn't able to. And because the left had this approach that it should be the state that should give all those answers, uh, once they got into power, they basically shut down and they didn't remobilize or continue to mobilize all the experiences that were not really double power, but almost, or dual power, but almost that were happening in Greece. Um, and, and so I think that, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's the difficult question, but in order to build any sort of transformative project, we, we have to play on those boards at the same time. At this, on the one hand, we do have to try to use the instruments of the state and to uh, mobilize, to build policy, policies and, and, and campaigns around them. But um, in the concrete questions of mobilization, we need to um, get a bit away from the, the strategic uh, the direction of electoral policies and restart to build those groundwork and also the labor movement is very important in order to be capable to even once, if, if and once you get into a place of power, you will, be, you will have something that backs you and that allows you to move away from that type of state and build actually any form of institutions that uh, can reflect um, popular power. Gabriel Hetland, you have one minute. Um, just, I mean, I think that, you know, the question of the dangers we're facing now, I think one uh, plausible answer, and actually the answer that I would give is a strong left is the best way, obviously, to get to something we want, a leftist government, a democratic socialism, even left populism, but I think it's also the safest way to defend the mere minimal institutions of bourgeois democracy. I think that there's recent research coming out that the defund the police and the, you know, the huge protests over the summer may have won the election for Biden, may have actually got us there. And I think in the case of Venezuela, comparing it to other cases, when there was a strong mobilized radical left inside and outside of parties, that was when the minimal conditions of bourgeois democracy were functioning most robustly. So I think we can have an argument empirically to say that we need a strong mobilized left um, and that that will actually be good also for our liberal friends slash enemies um, to defend against fascism. So I think that there's you know, one unique place where we can say it is a good answer for a lot of different things. All right, thank you everyone. Muchísimas gracias a todos. Um, this was a wonderful discussion and thanks for allowing me to moderate it. Thank you.